Imagine a world that is very different from today. A world where there are no public galleries full of colourful paintings. Where the names of great men like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo are hardly known. Where art is considered purely decorative and the artist a mere craftsman. It's astonishing, yet this was Britain 400 years ago. Since then, great works of art have flooded onto British shores and our appreciation of art and artists has been transformed. This is the story of the private collectors who brought a wealth of treasures from overseas, whose patronage encouraged British-born artists and whose personal passion for art and individual taste helped create this cultural revolution and shape the artistic direction of our nation. In this programme, I'll be looking at the golden age of collecting in the 18th century. Before this, just a handful of privileged men and women had travelled abroad, developing a pioneering passion for art. But now, this enthusiasm spread throughout the entire aristocracy, who began importing the very best European paintings by the shipload. They've got gold and they've got silver, and, and, yeah. and you know, people are quite happy to take that. Mm -hmm. I'll explore how the appreciation of art offered a new form of cultural currency. And as their collections grew, art lovers like Thomas Cook created grand country seats to display them. Houses like this were built for show. I'll see how the rich and powerful Dukes of Richmond at Goodwood House supported the revolutionary idea that the view from a window could be a worthy subject for a painting. and how Petworth House and the third Earl of Egremont, its bohemian owner, helped establish the painters who would become the great masters of British art. London at the dawn of the 18th century. The act of union between England and Scotland had created a new nation, Great Britain, poised to enjoy a period of peace and prosperity. In this newly affluent age, the leading patrons of the arts would not be the monarchy, but Britain's landed gentry, more numerous and more wealthy than ever before. A powerful new breed of connoisseur collector was emerging. A culturally informed aristocrat who would use art to define status. It was their money and their taste that would shape the artistic direction of this nation. This was a time when young aristocrats were expected to earn their cultural credentials with a grand tour of Europe, often lasting several years. With a tutor to keep them on the straight and narrow, Italy was a favourite destination. They took in all the major sites and art galleries, including the Uffizi in Florence and the Colosseum in Rome. It was essential to return with an enviable collection of artwork, as proof you'd matured into a person of taste and discernment. And there was one man who, more than any other, embodied this new, culturally confident age. Celebrated by his peers as England's Apollo of the Arts, Richard Boyle, 3rd Earl of Burlington, returned from his grand tour with enough treasures to fill 800 trunks. Inspired by the work of the Italian Renaissance architect Palladio, he built this magnificent Thameside villa, not to live in, but to house his newly acquired collection. 
Burlington's Neo-Palladian style, with its restrained facades and rational planning, became a hallmark of 18th century Britain. This unique marriage of art and architecture set the benchmark for every serious British collector. The tasteful display of your art would become a sign of social status and intellectual sophistication. While most of Burlington's collection has now been dispersed, numerous British aristocrats would follow his example on a much grander scale, showing off the highlights of their collection in country retreats, often extended or even specially built for the purpose. Agricultural wealth pouring into East Anglia at this time funded the construction of Holcombe Hall in Norfolk. This great Palladian villa was created in the 1730s under Burlington's supervision for Thomas Cook, who later became first Earl of Leicester. The house was conceived as the perfect setting for Cook's art collection and it embodies the taste of a new generation of 18th century connoisseurs. Today, great works by the 17th century masters such as Rubens hang at Holcombe because Cook's grand tour lasted six years, making it the longest in history. He bought Van Dyck's and picked out the very best paintings and statues by the Italian artists like Guido Reni, There were many great collections being built up at this time, but what makes Holcomb stand out for me is the way that house and collection grew together. It's the perfect grand tour house built in the style and spirit of the age. But Thomas Cook wasn't always a studious and refined art lover. His parents died when he was just 10 years old, and Cook was adopted by his grandparents, who took his education very seriously. When he became a little too keen on hunting and cockfighting, they sent him off on the obligatory cultural tour overseas. The current Viscount Cook and his family still live here at Holcombe where the archives contain a fascinating personal account of how the boisterous young cook was seduced by the art of Italy. You get the impression that he really caught the grand tour bug in a big way. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Um, this is a letter uh, mm -hmm. which we have, which he wrote uh, in, in uh, 1714, so a year in, from Rome to his uh, uncle. I have become, since my stay at Rome, a perfect virtuoso and a great lover of pictures, even so far as to venture to encroach on the kindness of my guardians in having bought some few. So it really sounds as if he was just asking for more pocket money. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and thankfully, thankfully it was given because he was able to buy yet more treasures. And I suppose then at this point he realised that he needed to create somewhere to put all the things that he bought. Yes, I mean, houses like this were built for show, to, mm. to, to show off to the public and to visitors and to your guests, um, your collection mm. and vis-a-vis -vis your learning and knowledge, really. The pioneering collectors that travelled to Europe a hundred years previously favoured the great Renaissance artists like Titian and Leonardo da Vinci. But demand soon outstripped supply, inflating prices beyond what most buyers were prepared to pay. To prevent Italy being completely stripped of its treasures, Italian authorities imposed laws, making old masters almost impossible to export. So the art lovers of Thomas Cook's generation began to develop broader tastes. 
By the time Cook set off on his grand tour, the art market was leading prospective picture buyers in a new direction, and certain previously overlooked artists were becoming the new collectibles. Rome, with its ancient ruins, was one of the highlights of the Grand Tour. And here, British travellers were enchanted by the work of the 17th century classical painter Claude, who had long been a favourite among Roman cardinals. And no one more so than Thomas Cook. The landscape room here at Holcombe is a real gem of British collecting. It contains one of the finest groups of Claude's work in private hands, still hung exactly as it was in Thomas Cook's day. At first glance, we might think these are simply pastoral scenes. But in Cook's day, collectors wanted more than that. The narrative aspect of a painting was still very important, and each of these actually depicts a scene from classical mythology. Claude was a very methodical painter, using certain building blocks, such as the lone tree, the classical ruin, and the distant mountains, again and again in his paintings. His skill was in arranging these into a different composition each time, creating a series of imaginary landscapes. Claude had really stumbled across the perfect formula to appeal to the 18th century English aristocrat because his paintings combine the viewer's desire for intellectual content by their all-important references to classical narratives with the beautiful landscape background. Claude's carefully composed images of nature inspired a new fashion for landscape gardening amongst the aristocracy who tried to emulate these scenes on their country estates. As an early collector of Claude's work, Thomas Cook was paving the way for the new genre of landscape painting, which would become such an important part of the story of art in this country. Thomas Cook continued to collect art for the house right up until his death in 1759. At a time when Britain had no national art gallery, the cultural influence of private collections like this was significant. A personal invitation to visit somewhere like Holcombe was the only opportunity most people would ever get to see really first-class art in this country. The house and the influential collection that remains here are Thomas Cook's lasting legacy. The remarkable thing about the 18th century was that passionate art lovers like Thomas Cook were not a one-off. This has become known as the golden age of British collecting with very good reason. It was a time when our pursuit of art reached fever pitch and many wealthy aristocrats were dedicating themselves and their considerable fortunes to the cause. In a boom year like 1725, the British imported over 750 paintings and 6,000 prints from Italy alone. Such was the enthusiasm for art, there was even a new gentleman's club founded by and for British collectors. The Society of Dilettanti, of which Thomas Cook was an early member, allowed grand tourists to develop the artistic knowledge they'd gained abroad upon their return home. It was also a riotous all-male club. Horace Walpole observed that the nominal qualification is having been in Italy and the real one being drunk in Rome. Historian Jeremy Black has spent many years studying this particularly vibrant period. So here we are at the Uffizi, and you really get the idea. It's the golden age of collecting, don't you? They all look so passionate about what they're doing. Well, they're certainly passionate. In yeah. fact, you'll notice them all gazing there at the nude. Yes, um, you see a number of features here. First of all, you've got a lot of people here. You've got a literal account of what were on the walls, and this is one of the reasons people purchase paintings like this, because it, as it were, was a record of the art. 
there's several different forms of art coexisting when the British uh, buy art in Italy. So it's the very richness, the multiplicity of cultural worlds and the opportunities therefore for collectors, as collectors, to both educate themselves in different styles and to basically acquire what they like. They are really the big international collectors by this point, yes. aren't they? The British are the great inter international collectors. And many of the aristocratic grand tourists not only use agricultural wealth, but also use the wealth from the coal that is dug up from their estates. They've got gold and they've got silver, and, and, and you know, people are quite happy to take that. Mm -hmm. One of the ways you show your taste, and of course spare, spend the family money, is by going around Europe purchasing things, seeing things, acquiring what they called virtu. And you really want to bring back a few pictures to show that you've been you there. Don't bring you? back the pictures to show that you've been there. You bring back the pictures because also you want things to hang on your mm. walls, which is very important. All of these people are building nice houses in Britain, these grand 18th century houses with these high ceilings, many more spaces for, uh, for, for paintings. So they need paintings to go in there. And there are some cases of people actually specifying the size of painting they wanted. Yeah, it's um, quite but lovely. also, you know. Even if you've got paintings already, some of the old paintings might be gloomy, they might be damaged by, uh, by water or the years. So to have some bright paintings mm. splashed in colour showing where you had been, that was great. Yes. By the mid-18th century, Venice had usurped Rome as the favourite destination of British grand tourists. A cosmopolitan centre of trade where anything was possible. Then, as now, the city thoroughly seduced British visitors. And all were keen to take home a visual record of their trip. This spawned a whole new art market, as Venetian painters supplied city views for the endless streams of foreign visitors. And one artist's output particularly caught the eye of British collectors, Giovanni Antonio Canal, who we now know as Canaletto. Canaletto had begun his career painting theatrical scenery. It was a training ground that served him well. He often took a view from two perspectives and then combined them into a single, more expansive image rather like using a wide-angle lens. Long before the Impressionists, Canaletto was painting out of doors, recording scenes from everyday life. From the carefully observed view before him, Canaletto created an enhanced, augmented Venice of his own. And it was Canaletto's version of Venice that the British grand tourists wanted to hang on their walls to remind them of their travels in Italy during the long, cold winters back home. Canaletto soon became Venice's most popular contemporary painter. But behind many a great artist, there's a canny agent. Canaletto would not have enjoyed such success without the help of British entrepreneur Joseph Smith. Smith started out in Venice as a fish merchant, but soon realised that there was much more money to be made in pictures than in fish. He had the three main attributes of any successful dealer, a good eye, an instinct for what the market wanted, and a natural ability to negotiate. It was not for nothing that he became known as the Merchant of Venice. In many ways, it was Joseph Smith that made Canaletto's career. As Canaletto's main agent, Smith kept a close eye on the artist's output and used his British connections to their mutual benefit. 
Joseph Smith knew everyone who was anyone in Venice, and he often held soirees to entertain visiting British aristocrats. During the course of the evening, he would ply them with wine and then produce a catalogue containing examples of Canaletto's work. It proved to be a very successful formula. Together, Smith and Canaletto enjoyed a roaring trade. There are now more of Canaletto's Venetian views in Britain than there are in Venice itself. And it was Joseph Smith that introduced Canaletto to the Englishman who would become a pivotal figure in his career. Charles Lennox, the second Duke of Richmond. Richmond was born on the family estate at Goodwood in West Sussex in 1701. His father, the illegitimate son of Charles II, had used his family connections to amass one of the great art collections of the 17th century. So, like many young aristocrats of his generation, the second duke had grown up surrounded by a significant collection of paintings, including beautiful works by Van Dyck. Richmond inherited the family passion for art. But when the 18-year-old set off on his grand tour, it was more than a cultural trip. There was an added incentive to escape. He'd been forcibly married off to Sarah Cadogan, the 13-year-old daughter of a British ambassador, in order to settle his father's gambling debt. He spent the next three years enjoying all the delights of the continent, including those of an Italian mistress. On his return, he decided to spend his last night of freedom at the theatre, where he was bowled over by the beauty of one of the young ladies in the audience. On inquiring who she might be, he was delighted to discover that she was, in fact, his own wife. The shy teenager he'd spurned three years previously had blossomed into a vivacious young woman, and their forced marriage matured into one of the great love affairs of the century. Shortly after he returned home, Richmond commissioned some Venetian views by Canaletto as a souvenir of his adventures in Italy. The paintings were a great success with the Duke, who proudly displayed them at Richmond House, his home in London. In Richmond, Canaletto had gained a very useful English admirer because his lucrative Venetian market would not last forever. In 1740, the War of Austrian Succession plunged the continent into a period of political turmoil, which discouraged all but the most determined British tourists. Canaletto's art market in Venice crashed, and he needed to look elsewhere. Hoping the British aristocrats who had commissioned him so abundantly in Italy would do the same back home, Canaletto travelled to England. Entering London in 1746, he found himself in the largest and fastest growing city in Western Europe, a vibrant artistic centre where careers could be relaunched and fortunes repaired. Armed with a letter of recommendation from Joseph Smith, the artist was pinning his hopes on one particular patron. Canaletto went straight to the Duke of Richmond's house in London, and it was Richmond who would give the artist his first commission on British soil and an all-important introduction to the English social scene. But the Duke was not alone in supporting Canaletto. In the Goodwood archives, an intriguing letter from Richmond's former tutor, Thomas Hill, reveals that several people had been working behind the scenes to secure Canaletto's first London commission. 
The idea was hatched over a drunken dinner attended by Hill and a flamboyant character called Owen McSwinney, who would become Canaletto's main agent in London. We have this wonderful letter in the archive, which is dated uh, Tuesday, May the 20th, 1746. So that's interesting, because that was before Canaletto came to England yes, for the first yeah, time. Yeah. So this is sort of preparing the way. Yes. And in it, he, he mentions sort of our old friend, McSwinney. McSwinney, this wonderful Irish agent. Yes, the yeah. sort of the rogue, <laughs> who in, in many ways in, perform these introductions, but you'll never quite know actually what's going on in the background. But certainly he was friendly <laughs> to the Duke. Yes. And he says, uh, Hill says to the Duke, I told him the best service I thought you could do him would be to let him draw a view of the river from your dining room, which in my opinion would gain him as much reputation as any of his Venetian prospects. This commission then from the Duke mm. of Richmond was pretty instrumental in starting Canaletto's career in England, wasn't it? Yes, and I think that's why Canaletto took so much trouble mm. over the two paintings from Richmond House, mm. where he really pulled out all the stops to produce superb paintings. Because once they'd been given the seal of approval by the Duke of yes. Richmond, yeah. he'd really arrived. And they would be seen by all the most important people mm. in the country. He was really trying to sell himself by doing this commission. Mm. The paintings captured the view from the Duke's townhouse in London, but they were specifically conceived for the walls of his estate at Goodwood, where they still hang today. Canaletto's paintings are subtly balanced compositions, using unusual angles and fragments of buildings to create the impression that we're just looking out of a window, catching a glimpse of life going on outside. Like in his Venetian scenes, he's also enhanced the view here, enlarging the sweep of the Thames to add a feeling of grandeur and to bring St Paul's into view centre stage. Another charming thing about Canaletto's paintings is his use of figures in the foreground. They're so minutely observed and meticulously painted. Look at those men with their frock coats and the ladies with their full skirts promenading along the terrace. Richmond's commission was a pivotal moment, not just for Canaletto, but for the development of art in Britain. Up to this point, landscape paintings had always included historical or mythological references to give them intellectual appeal. But Canaletto took the revolutionary step of leaving this out altogether. These are pure cityscapes celebrating the beauty of buildings and the joys of city life. Canaletto showed us that it was quite acceptable to paint places as a subject in their own right. The idea that art could simply capture the contemporary view from a window would gather momentum as the 18th century progressed. At this point, Britain's aristocracy were riding high. They controlled the government, owned most of the land, and enjoyed enormous personal wealth. And as the population of the capital swelled, those lucky enough to own country estates increasingly spurned the booming city for the quieter pleasures of rural life. The shift in focus from city to country went hand in hand with the increasing popularity of country pursuits. And this would present a great opportunity for a new genre in art that reflected the favourite pastimes of wealthy British patrons. Suddenly, the landowner wanted not only a portrait of himself, but of his horses and hounds too. The estate at Goodwood was already famed for its hunting parties. 
when Charles Lennox succeeded his father becoming the third Duke of Richmond, he proved an equally passionate animal lover. An early portrait shows him caressing his favourite dogs. With peace now restored on the continent, the Duke was able to follow in his father's footsteps, embarking on an extensive grand tour. As well as the usual stopping points in France and Italy, the Duke spent several months in Holland studying anatomy at Leiden University. It was a very formative time. The scientific grounding that he gained here would profoundly influence his artistic tastes in later life. On his return home, the Duke threw himself into making his mark on Goodwood House and the art collection it contained. his love of animals and country pursuits, it's not surprising that the third duke was quick to embrace the newly popularised sporting portrait. And in being the first to spot the potential of an unknown equestrian painter who would go on to define the genre, the duke would have a major influence on the development of British art. <laughs> In the 1750s, the Duke began a palatial new stable block at Goodwood. Observers commented that his horses lived in greater luxury than he did. It was here, in the stable boys' quarters, that a little-known English artist stayed for nine months while he worked on his first major commission. George Stubbs was the Liverpool-born son of a leather worker. Like the third Duke, he had also studied anatomy from an early age. His early career had been unremarkable. A few run-of-the-mill portraits of local dignitaries, but not much else. But at the age of 32, Stubbs immersed himself in a project that would transform his art. Striving to emulate the anatomical accuracy of Leonardo da Vinci, who he so admired, Stubbs spent 18 months holed up in a remote farmhouse dissecting horses to study the intricacies of their bones and their muscles. Even before Stubbs published his groundbreaking Anatomy of the Horse, his drawings were already being circulated and admired. It was while he was working on this that he first came into contact with the third Duke of Richmond. In fact, it was probably their shared passion for horses and anatomy that brought them together. The Duke was taking a huge risk in commissioning a totally unknown painter. But he recognised that Stubbs' drawings had lifelike accuracy that no other artist had achieved. And in 1759, Richmond gave Stubbs his first major commission. To produce a series of equestrian portraits for Goodwood House. The paintings that Stubbs created still form part of the family collection today. They feature views of racehorses in the park, as well as hunting and shooting parties in the grounds. They're a fascinating historical record of daily life on a landed estate, and they're full of intriguing details. The main figure in this picture is Henry Fox, with whom the Duke's sister scandalously eloped. Stubbs also features servants, indicating the Duke's status as a gentleman in charge of a large household. 
Stubbs raised the status of sporting painting to become a form of country group portrait. This celebration of rural life heralded a new direction in art. Before long, British collectors would fall in love with landscape as a subject in its own right. Following the success of his work for the Duke of Richmond, commissions from other landed gentry came flooding in. With Richmond's support and backing, Stubbs was able to realise his full potential. He cast aside his days as a struggling portraitist and emerged as the artist that defined a genre in painting and captured a particular moment in British rural life. And Stubbs' enduring popularity would not be the Third Duke's only contribution. By the mid-18th century, many British collectors were beginning to recognise and support our homegrown talent. But Richmond realised that our artists were still struggling against their foreign competitors. France and Italy had art academies that recognised rising talent with medals and prizes. They also had sculpture galleries and life-drawing classes allowing students to study the human form. But Britain still had no national art school and no public sculpture galleries. While Richmond could visit the collections of other art-loving aristocrats, these were in private homes and were not easily accessible to budding artists. With his scientific background, Richmond understood the artistic importance of anatomical study better than most. So he came up with a plan to give young British painters the same facilities enjoyed by their continental counterparts. The Duke of Richmond created a new purpose-built sculpture gallery at his London home to give British painters the rare opportunity to study and draw the human form. The venture was begun with the best of intentions, but it was not long before the Duke was called away to the continent on military matters. On his return home, he found a sarcastic note pinned to the door, complaining about the lack of prizes. Rather disgruntled, the Duke closed his gallery immediately. Richmond's scheme may have been imperfectly realised, but the idea behind it was symptomatic of a growing awareness that artists needed a formal school. Such schemes paved the way for the foundation of London's Royal Academy a decade later. The Academy offered public lectures on art, as well as drawing classes, and an annual exhibition where potential patrons could view the work of the most promising contemporary artists. The first meeting was held on December the 14th, 1768, chaired by the Academy's first president, Joshua Reynolds. The son of a clergyman, Reynolds studied art in London before travelling to Rome, where he absorbed the work of the great masters. Reynolds returned to London, inspired to raise British portrait painting to a whole new level. His unrivaled draftsmanship, combined with his ability to flatter, soon made him a great favourite amongst the English aristocracy. Everyone who was anyone was painted by Reynolds, including the third Duke of Richmond. Reynolds was the perfect choice as first president of the Royal Academy. Not only was he a great artist, but he was also very socially confident and a smooth operator, which stood him in very good stead at a time when the social status of the artist was still highly questionable. The Royal Academy, with Reynolds at its head, raised the whole profession of painting in Britain. And it also changed the way that collectors saw art. 
and artists. The Royal Academy quickly established itself at the heart of the London art scene and became an essential destination for every serious art collector. What's quite fascinating about the Royal Academy is obviously it was an institution where artists could learn, could study, but it gave them a lot more than that, didn't it? It did. I mean, at its heart it was a school, but it also brought in the marketplace. And so the, the unusual aspect of the Academy is that you had everything under one roof. You had the schools, you had the annual exhibition, and that became the great shop window for mm. the, um, all of the artists associated with the Academy and any other professional painter that wanted to send their work and sculptor um, to the exhibition um, held every year in May. They all took part very enthusiastic to hang their paintings. I mean, it's a wonderful sight, isn't it? It's incredible. It's spectacular, really. This room was designed to be a gallery by mm. William Chambers, so it's the first purpose-built gallery as such in London, um, certainly of this scale. And look at them all. I mean, you can understand why some of the artists were a bit peeved if there's... <laughs> yes. <laughs> ..were hung right at the top of the wall. That's called skying. Um, Is it? Yeah. <laughs> So you get lots of comments in, in letters from people saying they skied my picture, which meant that they'd hung it up oh. certainly near the ceiling there. But equally, you'd be mm. hung near the skirting board. and uh, Below the level. That was even the, more risky yeah. because you would often find your canvas was damaged by umbrellas and hobnail boots and such like. Oh, you know. I see. But it was an incredibly crowded space. And in this image, you have the Prince of Wales here being escorted by Joshua oh, Reynolds. Yes. You see his ear trumpet. Being a shop window, that's a lovely idea. And how did they go about introducing the artist to the patrons? The most important night of the year was, without doubt, the annual dinner, the banquet oh. that the Academy held at the beginning of each exhibition. Mm. They swiftly realised its potential yes. as a networking event. And the artists mingle amongst their guests. Mm. And so you could position yourself next to the uh, person that you were desperately hoping would become your patron. And so this really was a golden opportunity to rub shoulders and um, get some business. That's a lovely moment for British art, actually, because it's British artists taking themselves seriously for the first time. It is. And so that's obviously the social side of what went on at the Academy. Uh, but this is very much more the studious side, isn't mm. it? Is that the Royal Academy Schools? This is a representation of mm. the Life Academy, as it was called, which mm. was the service that the Academy brought that no one really, no one else was able to offer. You had access to the living human nude figure <laughs> to draw from, both male and female, which was highly unusual in Europe at that time. Most countries, France, for instance, wouldn't have provided female nude models no. to draw from from the schools. No, so this was seen very as a forward -looking. very forward-looking, but again, I think this shows the ambition of what was going on with mm. the Academy. They thought, right, we, we can do what no one else is mm. doing. The British school is going to be the best because we're going to have the best um, materials to study from. We're going to have the best school in Europe. And so this is almost like an official group portrait of the very early Academy painted by Zoffany for the King. British artists now enjoyed the recognition and social status they had lacked for so long and a central space to show and market their work. The public could see brand new output by rising British artists. By the late 18th century, the enjoyment of art had become a respectable form of popular entertainment. And not just in London. Visiting the private collections in our great country houses was now a favorite national pastime and newly published guidebooks outlined the many remarkable artworks that could be seen. Where once Britain's collections had been accessible to just a select few, increasingly owners were willing to open their doors and share their homes with an inquisitive and appreciative public. And there was one man who more than any other moved the story of art patronage into the modern age. Rather than employ artists to do his bidding, he invited them into his home to enjoy his art collection and explore their own creative talents. He gave them the freedom to paint whatever they wanted. This forward-thinking patron 
was George Wyndham, 3rd Earl of Egremont, the bohemian owner of Petworth House in West Sussex. Petworth, and the art collection it contained, was a place of inspiration for a young British painter who would become the star of his generation, Joseph Mallard William Turner. Petworth Park, glowing with the colours of sunset, would be immortalised in some of his finest work. Egremont was just a 12-year-old boy when his father died in 1763. But his 70-year term at Petworth is often described as a golden age in the history of the house and its collection. Egremont grew up to be forward-thinking and a benevolent landlord, allowing local villagers to use his parkland as they pleased. One French visitor observed with surprise, he suffers the peasants of his village to play bowls and cricket on the lawn before the house, to scribble on the walls, and even on the glass of his windows. Egremont was also a liberal and generous host. Petworth became home from home for many contemporary British artists who were free to explore the house and grounds, as well as Egremont's extensive art collection. One aspiring English painter wrote home excitedly of dining in a room full of Van Dykes. By the end of the 18th century, great houses like Petworth were bearing the fruits of 150 years of art collecting in Britain. Thanks to our many passionate collectors, it was no longer necessary to travel abroad to experience first-class works of art. They could now be enjoyed at home. When it came to art, Egremont was known as a man who thought for himself. During his lifetime, he expanded the family collection to over 600 paintings, particularly favouring contemporary British talent. In his North Gallery here at Petworth, Egremont radically chose to allow paintings and sculpture to intermingle and hung paintings by old masters of the past alongside new works by British artists, as equals. Egremont was, of course, a regular guest at the Royal Academy's summer exhibition. And it was here that he first spotted a strikingly original piece by the young English artist Turner. Egremont snapped up the painting for his collection, and it was the start of a lifelong friendship between artist and patron. For the current Lady Egremont, it remains a particularly powerful painting. So this is your favourite painting in the whole collection? Yes, it is. It, really, it was the first picture that Lord Egremont bought. He bought it in 1802 from the Royal Academy, before, before he really knew Turner. And what's interesting about the picture is there's a huge amount of sky, mm -hmm. a huge amount of sea, and the actual incident of what's going on is in quite a narrow band in the middle. Yes, you're right, that's fascinating. And it's a very patriotic picture in the sense that there's a great British warship right here in the background, which would have been flying right in the middle of the picture, the red ensign, which is the naval flag, um, because this is 1802, and it's three years before the Battle of Trafalgar, and we were petrified of the French who were about, you know, we, th we, th we thought they might invade. And so this, would, this ship would have been patrolling the channel. And Turner's put it there as a sort of calm, silent ship at anchorage. Giving it pride of place. And it's a sort of contrast to the drama that's mm. happening on the right-hand side. Yes, that's beautiful, that balance. So do you find you come and look at this picture quite often? I do. Yes. This is the one I'm drawn to the most. Yes, I do. I'm, I'm not surprised. Come. I can see that. You must almost feel that you know Turner <laughs> living here. I, yes, I, I do believe that the atmosphere of Turner's time is still here a bit. And that was its moment, really. 
Anyway. It was the mo most important moment in the history of this house, I think, most interesting moment. It was when the house really came to life. The unique atmosphere at Petworth during Egremont's day is captured in the hundreds of watercolour sketches that Turner painted during his time here. Well, now this is actually now called the Red Room. The house came to feel like a luxurious art academy where Turner and many other artists, including his contemporary John Constable, were welcomed as house guests. The opportunity to spend time with these great works to study and enjoy them inspired the artists that came here to take their own art to a new level. Egremont gave the artists their own space to socialise, to sketch and to paint. This was the old library. Now, in a disused wing of the house, closed to the public, it has hardly changed since Turner's day and you can sense at once that it's a very special place. This space here is just so magical because you get such a sense of being, you know, somehow behind the scenes, you know, away from the formal collection. Very much so. This, this room, the old library, um, was effectively converted into an artist's studio during that period and artists of the generation of uh, Turner were, were at liberty to use the room as a studio. And of course, it has this fabulous uh, east-facing window. Which is there. presumably this one that's shown here. Yes, in, one, in, in some yeah. of the watercolours uh, which Turner made at Petworth in 1827, several of those show the old library, and, and one or two of them actually show artists working in here. Mm. And yes, you can clearly see the, the window. The shape of the window. These are great, aren't they? Because they give you such an idea of life going on here with the artists. And, and look at this one, people just hanging out. <laughs> they really do, because, of course, they weren't intended for um, anyone else to see. They were Turner's own private records, so he really does show the place in the roar. And, mm. of course, we've got these people in, in wonderful Regency costumes with their shoes off and lounging yes. about on the furniture in a way that we would today. Mm. Of course, one of the things we tend to forget is that there weren't that many places where artists could go and see wonderful painting collections like this, were there? Absolutely not. And uh, in order for artists of this generation to see great works of art, they very often had to go abroad or make use of collections like this. And of course, Petworth's was and still is one of, one of the finest. Um, and we certainly know that many of the artists who came here, Turner included, made great use of the, the collection here. Um, the Third Earl allowed the artists to have paintings removed from the major rooms and brought to their bedrooms or brought to here. That's incredible, the old actually. Oh, it really it's is. really lovely. C completely. And so when an inventory of the collection was done after the Third Earl's death in 1837, um, there were over 50 paintings in the old library, most of which had been brought here by artists, presumably, mm -hmm. to, for, for purposes of study. Oh, of course. He was just very generous like very that. Very generous. Yeah. No sense of treating everything with kid gloves. It was an actually living no. collection. No, very way. much so. Mm. Very much so. The relaxed, bohemian atmosphere at Petworth suited Turner well. Freed for a time from financial constraints, he could experiment, something that few of his predecessors had had the opportunity to do. Our modern concept of an artist is of someone driven by their own creativity, giving expression to the ideas inside their head. But you have to remember, this is a relatively recent thing. And Turner was the first British painter to be given the freedom to do this. In that sense, he's our first truly modern artist. It was Turner's sheer brilliance that finally succeeded in doing what previous British artists had struggled to do, to raise the status of landscape painting from second rate to an object of desire in its own right. Turner painted four works for the dining room at Petworth House. It is perhaps the finest group of estate views he ever created, and it shows his skill as a mature artist.
the fact that Egremont hung Turner's new scheme alongside revered artists of the past, like Holbein, shows just how highly he regarded the British painter. When I see these paintings in here, I get the really strong sensation that they must have been painted by someone who'd lived and breathed Petworth. Because look at them. These aren't just views of a park, they're paintings of an atmosphere. That magic moment when you look out of the window for the last time before the shutters are closed for the day. And if you think about what Turner's done with his canvas, he's devoted three quarters of it to light and the effects of light that he witnessed on the landscape. This was a landmark in the story of commissioning, because here was a patron, Lord Egremont, who said to a painter, Turner, come and stay in my house for as long as you like, whenever you like, and paint your impressions of my parkland, and I will hang them on my walls. And that's quite a brave thing to do. As a patron, Egremont is most famous for his friendship with Turner, by whom there are 20 paintings at the house. But the breadth of the collection here is testimony to the boldness of his taste and his support for the fledgling school of British artists. Egremont died at the distinguished age of 85, after catching a chill attending the young Queen Victoria at Brighton. His obituary stated, many of the finest pictures produced in our day in England, and certainly the very finest works of sculpture, were the results of his unlimited commissions. During the eventful 18th century, a century of British confidence, our collectors had transformed the visual culture in this country. They had brought the best of European art to these shores, as well as some of the greatest European artists. They boldly supported a rising school of British talent and encouraged the stars of the next generation to produce some of their finest work. In this golden age of art collecting, we had gone from being the poor relation of Europe to boasting some of the richest collections in the world. But these collections were still in the hands of a few wealthy individuals. In an era of emerging democracy, there was a growing recognition that art should move out of private rooms and into public galleries. Next week, I'll be meeting a new generation of 19th century art collectors whose purchasing power came from finance and industry. Their highly individual tastes would introduce a profusion of different styles to Britain. Many of the paintings collected and commissioned by great British collectors are now in public ownership. To find out more, visit www.bbc.co.uk forward slash your paintings.